And until we do that, then we are going to remain in the grip of um, a fairly nefarious bunch of bankers, uh, real bankers. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, it's perhaps trying to subvert that whole mechanism that the state, um, globalists, whatever term you want to do, use, um, trying to subvert that a bit by going underneath and creating a direct link to these um, intelligences that are undoubtedly out there. Um, and that, you know, can we create a series of some, something that's repeatable that we can take from group to group and perhaps empower people on a local level. Um, so yeah, I put that, I even mentioned uni, u, UFO community programming, because well, within the UFO community you've got, um, you've got ideas, of course, of what, you know, what contact should be, what communication should be. Should you even be trying to communicate at all? Should you just be putting marks on a blackboard about how many UFOs are spotted? You know, it's, it's, everyone's got their own idea of that. Um, and I think this whole idea of night vision um, I think we go on to that in a minute. The um, the whole idea of the night vision thing is that you've got a you've got an, you've, you've got a process by which you shortcut all of this stuff, all of this noise to do with what contact is. The whole night vision thing is mean you shortcut that because you you have a direct connection in one way by viewing that object. You have a direct connection to um, these entities, and the communication, of course, comes after. If you've spotted something, you can start the, some form of communication with it. Um, so. The scale, I mean, people will have heard, of course, of um, closing contact, uh, closing counts of the third kind, because, of course, that's based on the, the film. But this was actually, yeah, we're cutting things off here. This is, uh, uh, the, at the top, the, the title was the, this is the Alan Hynek scale. So Alan Hynek was a researcher from the sort of 60s, 50s and 60s. And um, he developed this scale. Stephen Greer claims he added the C5 on, but I don't think he did. Someone else, I'm pretty sure, um, uh, there's a guy called Richard Haynes wrote a book, um, I think before Greer bought, bought this, but Greer's adopted this term. Um, Stephen Greer is the guy that did the Disclosure Project and also CSETI, which we're basing some of this um, sort of experience on at the moment. Um, so you can see the list there, they're, they're just forms of contact. Um, and the fifth one is important because, of course, it suddenly shifts everything from this contact where sort of UFOs are at the center um, to, to it's a human initiated contact. So it's the whole idea that you use various bits of technology and your own consciousness to beckon in or vector these ET craft and these entities into some sort of uh, communication. Even um, if you, I want everyone to try and read this in the uh, space we've got after here. This is the um, CSETI working group manual. And, and uh, you know, as much as you can take this as some sort of example of what to do and, and not to be taken too literally, then this will even tell you um, the idea of what to do if a craft lands, how to approach that sort of thing. And some of that's based on, some of that's based on Greer's, they have had stuff happen, that is based on Greer's um, experience. Um, it's just he's quite strict about who can do that. He's got his whole hierarchy of ambassadors and who should go forward and stuff. So it's pretty convoluted, but that that is certainly um, worth a read as regards what to what what could happen and, and what possible um, avenues you can take. Um, so yeah, we put that. We mentioned contact can take many forms. All right. Okay. There's the. Um, Oh, I can move this, shrink this screen. There's the, that's the CSETI logo, so that's the one that appeared in a uh, crop circle. Um, that was in England, that was in Britain, wasn't it? So, so they were, again, uh, crop circle land over here. That was over here. Um, that's James Gilliland's ESETI, um, another, another version of that that goes from Trout Lake in Washington, and they have, they have tremendous results with, with stuff that they do, and they're, their contact is a bit less structured than Greer's, their, their sort of method for that. Uh, they're basically near, near a huge trout lake, near a huge mountain, um, which seems to be some sort of UFO base. You, you can go on YouTube and you can see the stuff that happens at the ranch there. Um, but they have regular contact with these um, discs um, that literally flash, they're called power ops. Oregon. Yeah, it's Oregon. Is it? In Washington, yeah, yeah. Um, Washington, near Washington. Washington, yeah, yeah, Washington State, yeah. This trout lake is called, I think. I don't know whether Mount Rainer, I think. Is it Mount Rainer? Ray, um, you got Mount Shasta, Mount Adams, actually. Mount Adams, Mount right. Adams, it's Adams, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, oh, yeah. And it seems that Mount Adams is some sort of base for this yeah, thing. It yeah, it glows. It glows. Right. Literally, green, green glows. The mountain glows, yeah. right. Yeah, I've seen some things not come out of Mount Adams, away from Mount Adams. Yeah, it, it is amazing there. I'd love, to, I'd love to go. I'm, I'm, I can't go to the USA, but I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to. I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to go over and, and see that um, because uh, it's the. I've seen craft that seem to apparently disappear into the mountain. But on top of that, on the C5 level, the, the craft then come over um, where it gets. How many people were there when you went there? Because it sounds seems like like hundred <laughs> people a weekend there at the moment. Um. No, I think there was about four of us. Oh, right. Yeah, we've got a lot of workers that work there. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. So right. we've got obviously Mount Shasta, which mm. is very that's close, and obviously that's where people remote view. 
Right. Um, and there's that's a lot of ET stuff there. But yeah. you know, in the line of three as you're flying over, you can see all three of them coming out of the clouds, the, the mm. mountains. It's lovely. And did you have an because they do do this 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 communication that if you oh, flash, I have an experience, <coughs> yeah, yeah, um, but this this whole idea that they they will flash and pulsate um, yeah. according. So if you do three flashes with a laser or, or a, a powerful flashlight, you will get three three pulses back. Um, yeah. Oh, oh right, so you, you yeah. can get some sort of direct contact as yeah. well, some sort of feeling or mind, mind contact, all, all of which is the same sort of thing. Is that what you're it saying? It is, yeah, I didn't yeah. need any of the lights. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, but that's where, we're, that's where it's all, isn't it, different for everyone, and that's where I was interested in your experience as a contactee, because you already know, you already know what contact is like, you know, do you enter some sort of weird parallel universe, does it feel any different? So most of us don't sort of know that, and it's trying to find out, well, how do we take um, an experience like yours and sort of build it into the group and so you can help other people discover is, is there a certain, is there a set feeling to that, is there a, some sort of voice in your head that happens when that sort of takes over, so that's all the sort of thing that's, and you're saying that's the sort of thing that happened at, uh, at Give yeah. James. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah James, what do you want me to say? What you happened? You, you, yeah, you. James has gone in, James, right, it's called the Field of Dreams basically, mm -hmm. you've got Mount Adams in front of you. And it is, it's a it's lovely sort of um, communal place, lots of people working there over the summertime. And um, I went with uh, Mike's partner, Lauren, and basically we're in the field of dreams and it was in the early part of the evening. James had just gone off to go and do his radio interview. And um, one of the workers had come up and said, you know, this is where people see a lot of orbs and things and can have communication, yeah, and they do have the lights and everything. And I chose not to, to use anything like that, obviously, because intentionally they know and I know that we're all there for a reason. Wherever you could be, you can you know, go to the supermarket, you can ask for something, can't you? And boom, that's where you find something. Um, and we, we were outside, sitting outside, and then you've got the Mount Adams in front of us. And like I said to you, it was what we saw what reminded me of like um, green crystals sort of like um, a Moldavite green, you know, just sparkling, just, just blinking. You'd, you'd think, like, you see things like a conference, did I just see that? Wow. Because no one could walk up to there, no one could get a car up there or anything. And then, you know, you carry on talking and it catches you again. And that's where people are saying it's like a gateway of, of energy can go in and out. Um, and so, busy, busy talking. And then all of a sudden, where you've got Mount Adams, all of a sudden to the side of it, to the, to the right side, just this big, massive orange orb just totally appeared, huge, right next to it. And um, I'm like, and then it starts moving, it's moving in a straight line. And then intuitively I said, see that star over there? It's gonna go into that star over there. And then you're thinking, then you doubt, you're quite, you know, you're doubting yourself, but you've got to go by the first thing you said, because you're generally kind of right. And, going in a straight line, you just went to that star and you just blinked, just went to the star like on top, piggybacked on top of it and just boom, out. It's like, what? okay, that's clever, that's spooky, you know, all the stars that you see out there. And then no sooner you said that again, I said, it's going to be another one. And the same place where the first orange one was, just went again and I said, it's going to go back into the other one. He went straight in where the other star was and then and one of the workers was there with us out there and he went, never seen anything like that in all of the things that they had seen. He said, that was absolutely remarkable. You know, and it was, because that experience was, was different yet again to all of the others. So to me, it's another learning experience. When I look at the stars now, I just think, oh, you know, they are very, very clever up there, what they can do. So yeah, he said he went quite totally safe for anybody to go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But that was great. Well, I mean, that's the interesting thing is like, is, is the... <clears throat> Because uh, you know we talk about things that are also on um, ley lines that that's, yeah. um, UFOs seem to like energy lines of the around the globe. So is it uh, we could we could find this out by probably doing a couple of weekends here. So is how much does human consciousness acting as an attractor actually work for this sort of thing? So um, because the Mount Adams area is known has been known as like Mount Shasta has been yeah. known for um, these uh, or discs. In itself. I mean, yeah. you've got a huge. Um, I'm heavily into Bigfoot. You've got huge Sasquatch, you know, people that mm -hmm. have, have witnessed. So it's no different than seeing, you know, mm -hmm. a UFO, you know, experiencer. Well, they're, they're Bigfoot experiences. 
you know, heck of a lot of energy there. And, and I went to a military base um, just outside. Um, it's McMinnville, where they have the big UFO um, uh, fest every year. And um, I went there with what I call Bigfoot Andy and Lauren again. And um, in the woods, and they have a lot of military training in the woods. And um, blackberry picking we were. Picking the blackberries, eating the blackberries, quite happy as Larry's. And all of a sudden, this, this all just, just came over our head and just flew in. I was like, okay. It's like a drone type of thing. And then, yeah, we saw two or three of them. And then I, on my Facebook page, I've got a picture of me and Bigfoot Andy absolutely pickled with orbs all around us. You know, it was excellent. Yeah, Oregon's the place to go. Yeah, um, I, I suppose it's specifically if those areas are really known yeah. for sighting, so yeah, say the yeah. Mount Adams, Mount Shasta. But the, but the point is, if if say this area around us isn't particularly known for that, then can we generate? So, do we prove therefore yeah. that consciousness can um, act as a magnet to invite these uh, entities and these UFOs in by the fact that we do a couple of weekends worth of this sort of experience and this meditation, this remote viewing, this sort of thing, these, these protocols, it's proving that those work. Because I suppose <coughs> James Gilliland could, always, could be onto a good thing that he doesn't actually need to do any of these things because these things are zipping out roundabout anyway. Um, I still think that he, to then communicate with these things, then you would need some sort of um, uh, system. You need a group of people, of course, that were interested and had the intent that they wanted to do that. But that's that's the thing. So you know, Glastonbury around here or near to here um, is known for its ley lines. So um, I don't know what sort of things that attracts, but it's 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 making that whole thing to is are there regular UFO flight paths or um, it can consciousness actually act as a um, a magnet to these things? And of course, Greer would say that you vector in these things, you send your message out, he says, you know, 24, a few hours beforehand, yeah. you send out your Direct vectored, your yeah. yeah, you send out your vectored thought, and literally, the way he does it, um, he gets the whole group to literally um, imagine the Milky Way, then you imagine um, you imagine the Earth, and you zoom down, and each time you go to a, 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 a deeper magnification level, to the point where you zoom right in on, on the UK, England, and then in this case, down on the the southwest, and uh, and you keep sending that out, and that's what they pick up on. So um, again, it's whether, that, it's whether that whole process um, but works. Then, but um, David, isn't it? I want to say Ken Phillips, but it's not Ken Phillips. On that on that sort of era um, of people, you had down Cornwall Way. What's his name? He did basically have a timetable of. of when you could see UFOs. Who's that? Because that's interesting. Because we, 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 there's Alan T. Greenfield does that. So does also there's another guy called Bruce Cathay does does no, that. Who's no, the called? He's really old school. Um, yeah, it's French yeah. guy. Sorry. The French guy. No. Yeah. Um, oh, I'll have to go back and look at home. He used to be a very good friend of Ken Phillips. He used to run before, and he was at your he. There was DVDs for sale on him um, at your conference a couple of years ago, and I was very I was, I was amazed that he was still doing it. Um, I have to think of the name, but that's what he does. He basically has worked out timelines of, of, of windows when you do see them. Right. The Kevin guy you just mentioned is from... Um, Ken Phillips. Ken Phillips? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. So yeah. not, Ken Phillips used to before. Before, right, okay. So a bit like a weather report. <laughs> kind of was. Um, yeah. The frequency, kind of Tuesday night's the, the best night. As bizarre as that sounds. As bizarre as it yeah. sounds, and Wednesday night's the worst. Well, I'll go back to my sightings and I'll let you do the same. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I, this is from uh, from this document. So I just whittled down these uh, these tubes. I'm going to read these out, and, and this is the sort of thing you should be, I suppose, thinking about tonight. Because this is all about um, the whole the whole word is, of course, intention and intention over expectation. So it's sort of not letting expectation that you will see something rule over your intention um, of of, of, of um, it's sort of that whole idea of having some. Um, which is quite hard for us as egotistical human beings to have some sort of purity of thought as regards this whole thing. Um, especially, I'll point out, if you, of course, listen to the whole thing about um, grey teas abducting and doing various things sexually with people, all this sort of stuff that you've heard about um, about ETs, that a lot of which seems to be military disinformation. Um, you know, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, none of this was going on. It was all very much human-like ETs that were having contact. And that's changed very much in the 80s. When Whitley Strieber, of course, came out with his, his book, um, then things changed rapidly. Um, and so, so it's quite hard for us to have this sort of thing, but I think you can shovel that thing to a side for, for a moment to try and have this, you try and get to this attitude of having some sort of intention um, that's not fear-based to try and get this thing um, um, moving. Um, so, 